Um, I'd like to introduce myself um, before we go going deep into the topic. My name is Ole Michaelis, as mentioned. Um, I'm 26 years old, um, living in Hamburg, northern Germany. And the Hamburg people say that Hamburg is the most beautiful city in the world. And I would like to invite you to check it out yourself. <laughs> um, I really love the city. Um, I'm a web nerd, user groupie, and sometimes a conference speaker. Um, and you can even tweet me at CodeStars. You can find my blog at codestars.eu. And I'm a curator of So Coded Conference, which happened uh, last year. And in my free time, I'll also work at Slide.io. I work at Jimdo. Um, I'm there for over a year now. And my working title is Open Source Rockstar, or Shipman, which is <laughs> kind of cool. but. And to, to put it more into the relation, um, we are free to choose our titles, so uh, I'm just software engineer stuff. Um, now at Jimdo, um, I started my first year at Jimdo in the infrastructure team, so did lots of operations and you know, keeping things running. Um, but I have a very, very strong software engineering background, and that's why I switched back to our very first uh, service-oriented architecture team now. Um, Jimnu, as a company, is, is a website builder, so we want people to have a website without knowing HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So whenever you know, your mom asks you to have a website, just send her to Jimnu, and she can do it on your own, and you have time for cool stuff, and not setting up WordPress. Um, yeah, service-oriented actor. So you, have, you, you might have read the, the, the title, and it has a pretty handy sub, subtitle there, and it's a, Beside the very awesome keynote animation, uh, it's for robust and scalable system. And I want to talk today about why, why is service-oriented actor necessary and why you should use it, what's, what's cool with that, um, what, what it really is, so what, what this fancy term means. And as last, um, I want to talk about how, how you can do it. And I also want to show some examples like in the wild. So when you start a project, um, usually all of us, or at least I am, I'm pretty excited because you know it's a greenfield project and I want to do everything right. Um, I'm, I'm super excited. I, I, want, I, I have the big picture of my product in mind. I want to be, be fast and you know, I want to avoid the mistakes I did in several projects before. So it's all about software architecture, right? As a, as a good engineer, um, we care a lot about software architecture. We're making a ton of plans, choosing a framework, and we want to work out the, the best of what's possible. So we want to build the best and most stable system we've ever built, right? Um, before I joined Jimdo, I worked at an incubator, also in Hamburg. And it was, it was a great time for me, because I had the opportunity every three months to start a new Greenfield project, which is <laughs> really, really cool. So when I started there, um, we had the idea of a mobile flea market, and it, it should be an, an iOS app. So uh, we didn't have any iOS developers, so we decided to build it with an with a off, offshore company, also in Germany. Um, so we had an API spec, which I had to fulfill as a backend engineer. And, you know, I, I, I was totally focusing on, on how to do it right. So I made a ton of plans, you know, I had a system design in my head, and. Uh, I totally wanted to make it with Symphony 2 because it's, it was super new at this time, and I heard that it's super, super good to build new stuff. Um, in, in all my jobs before, I always had to deal with legacy self-written frameworks and stuff, so I really felt that this one would be a good thing. And beside the architecture, it's also about you know, beautiful software. Um, any of you writing UML diagrams? Okay, that's really three people, that's great, because I also don't do it. Um, frankly, there might be reasons to do it, so I don't want to rant about that. But I, at least I feel like in, in Agile and, and you know, PHP startup land world, um, it's not Java, right? Even if some people treat it like that. Um, so beautiful software. Um, do you know that feeling when you've just like, written a class and it's fully tested and it fits onto your screen and has just like three methods? When I, have, when I have this moment, this is like, I'm, wow, this is so, so beautiful. I, want, you know, I just wanted to lean back and watch my code for about five minutes and feeling great. 
uh, so you know that feeling. It's great. So it's really about beautiful software, right? Beautiful design, beautiful classes, everything is tested, and you feel really, really confident about shipping it. But, you know, time, time went by, and even in, in the company we did, um, in the startup thing, it's getting complicated over time, right? So we're not a startup anymore. People joining the team. Um, and it's not only you doing, doing the coding, right? So there might be some more junior guys. There might be some students. And in the worst case, you have some India offshore stuff, which <laughs> is mostly you know, not, not the best quality, let me say like this. Um, so the code grows. It's getting more complex. And if you're taking metrics, like lines of code, this metric is like exploding, even if your features are like kind of staying the same. Um, this is really hard. Um, luckily, when I was at the, at the iOS mobile flea market stuff, um, we were an incubator. So before this happened, I just passed it away. <laughs> uh, I handed over to another team, to the founders team, and I went off to the next Greenfield one. Um, there was a very happy time for me. But unfortunately, the incubator lost all its money, even that can happen. And I had to look for a new job, so I joined my current company, which is Jimnu. And Jimnu, you know, is, it started in 2006, and it's like all the founders written the first version, and um, it's like a monolith thingy. Uh, I don't want to rant too much, but you know how, a co how code looks like when it's built 2006, right? And it's still maintained. <laughs> um, luckily, we got rid of PHP 4 now, <laughs> last year. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry. So um, I, got like, I got like a fast forward because from a startup point of view to that point, it's usually five or six years. And I had it because I switched the jobs uh, within two months. <laughs> so I really see now what does it mean when you have a team of 50 developers working on the same code base. And you have to make, you know, tech have you tried to make a technology decision with 50 people, like agreeing on that one database? It's, you know, it's horrible. You should never do it because you got uh, 50 people and you got 60 opinions and half of the room want to use NoSQL and the other ones want to use Postgres and there's MySQL and you can, you really, you can't even agree on one thing. So this is really hard and you should change before it's too late. So there is a time when your project is growing where you should realize Wow, when I, if, I, if I wouldn't stop now, this one would be the next monolith, big ball of mud, and you won't be able to split it even if you put like one year work in it. So it's really hard, and I know it's really hard to find that time because you know, just, you know, daily life passes by and you have, um, to, you have features you have to implement and there's stuff which has to be done, and um, I know it's hard. And if you would ask me what is the right time, I have no idea. It's just really, you should reflect on yourself, um, what's the code base like, and if you should split it into, into more different services. So, that's the why. Next is what. So what, what does service-oriented architecture mean? I mean, it's... It's more, more like a password at the moment, right? So there's no real definition. I mean, you could just pick up Wikipedia and say what it's saying, but this is just theory. So for me, I, I like to quote Amazon, because Amazon is, is doing pretty great when it comes to that. And this is Werner Vogels. He's the CDO of Amazon. And he did this quote, service orientation means encapsulating data with the business logic that operates on the data with the only access to a published service interface. And if your goal for today was to know what service-oriented architecture is, you've got to go now. <laughs> that is service-oriented architecture for me. Um, but, you know, we have quite a of time left, so I, I will go into some detail now. Um, but, but before, uh, I'd like to make another quote, and it's again from Amazon. This one is Jeff Bezos. Um, he recently bought, bought like, a, a newspaper stuff, uh, you might have heard of him. Um, he sent out an email back in 2006 to all Amazon employees. It's like, oh, it's not switching, my keynote's kind of hanging. Um, so he's sending out this mail, like Amanda, to every Amazon employee at this time. And Amazon at this time was already pretty, pretty big, right? And uh, they had quite a bunch of, of employees. And our keynote is really great. So he sent, again, he sent out this email to 
really all employees. You know, you have to imagine it's like a really bunch of people. And this, this was mentioned, all teams will henceforth expose their data and functionality through service interfaces. Teams must communicate through these interfaces with each other. There will, be, there will be no other form of inter-process communication allowed. No direct linking, no direct reads of other teams' data store, no shared memory model, no, DAO, no backdoors whatsoever. The only communication allowed is via server interface calls over the network. It doesn't matter what technology they use, and all service interfaces, without exception, must be designed from the ground up to be externalizable. That is to say, the team must plan and design to be able to expose their interface to developers in the outside world, no exception. And he closed this, that mandate, with anyone who does not follow this will be fired. Thank you, have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what? <laughs> right? Uh, this is a really a tough statement. And if I would have received this, e this email, I think I would quit. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was back in 2006, and when you think of what happened with Amazon since this day, um, they, they really followed this, and they followed it really, really strictly, and now they got Amazon Web Services. And they got super, super rich, and they're the biggest cloud, you know, around, and everyone knows it. And so this email had quite a lot of impact on Amazon. It was like the, the really beginning of Amazon Web Services. So that's why I really like to make this quote. Um, but before we go on, there's another quote I'd, I would like to read out. Um, this one is from Melvin, Melvin Conway. And he says, Organization which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. Um, I see a few of you like <laughs> agreeing on that. And if you don't agree on that yet, just think of your current project you're working on. Um, if you're a small team, I would bet you have a small code base. And, you know, it's really well designed because you have, clear, you have a clear communication structure. And to put the example back to, to my current company, um, we are a team of 50 people, but we are divided into, like, sub-teams. So we have a payment team, for example, we have a feature team, and uh, we have a platform team. And when you look at our code base, even if it's just one repository, you really see who, who belongs, so this class to whom it belongs. And whenever I, I think about these statements, I got another example popping up in my mind, um, why is this is so true. But there's more. <laughs> um, there's even more, more reasons to do service-oriented um, architecture. First, you can really have faster decisions because you can lower the amount of people per code base. Um, as, as I mentioned before, making a technology, technology decision with 50 people is kind of impossible. Uh, so when you would split up your services into smaller ones with smaller teams, every team can agree on what they want to do, and they don't have to ask like all the 40 other people because it's their responsibility to do it. And by the way, this is how the Ukraine is doing democracy. <laughs> Uh, you can unload responsibilities. Um, you, as a team, really are responsible for that service you're doing. Imagine you're doing the payment service. Almost every company has it, right? Otherwise, they can't afford you to go here. Um, so it's a payment thing is, is really cool because the feature team isn't responsible for what's happening over there, right? They just don't have to care. And it's funny, when you talk to developers, um, talking about payment, it's like a binary state. People just love it, and they're totally into it, or people just don't want to deal a shit with it. Uh, I, I'm the one, I, I don't want to deal anything with it. So I'm really happy if there's a team being responsible for all those kind of things. And usually the payment developers, at least the one I know, um, they hate all the stuff which is user-facing. So they hate implementing really cool features which make the users faster. So you can really like, lower the responsibilities per service, because you're only responsible for that one thing. And you can even, you know, you can even reduce complexity. Um, <laughs> other pictures is great, right? Uh, there's there's a, a fun fact about this picture. Um, when I was Googling for it, um, actually there's another one. It's like this, but it's a black phone. <laughs> so he did this more than once. But anyway, <laughs> um, so you can reduce complexity. Um, 
in your app, in your service, in your code base, right? And reduced complexity has like a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of um, good things come coming along, uh, which is easier onboarding. You know, when I joined Jimnu, I found myself with this one repository, and it took me about a month to dig through it. And when I remember the time when I joined like smaller companies and smaller code bases, it was just, you know, I, I, it took me about a day to, to get all the stuff. Um, so you get easier onboarding and you can have faster development because people would be more um, convenient and they would be more uh, certain in the changes they are doing, right? And this is really cool. And you can, again, lower the, the code base as it is, uh, so you get much happier developers, right? Uh, with a smaller code base, you can do more deployments because you're more confident about what you're doing. And you, get, you, know, you can get happier developers. And happier developers is always a, a thing you should aim for because they will stay, you know, they won't ask you for even more money because uh, they, they love to, to, to work with your code base. So this is really cool. And you can win at scaling because you can scale each service independently. So you don't have to scale your big ball of mud with you know, adding more servers or buying bigger ones. Uh, you can just scale this service um, who has the need for it. Imagine you have this big ball and your bottleneck is the database and when you have just one thing, you have to scale everything. Maybe in, if, if another service just don't need this kind of scaling. So that one is really, is really important. And to that picture, by the way, he's not like doing the swinging fist. <laughs> Actually, he's eating sand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, enough memes. Um, how, right? I promised you I'll talk about how you can, how you can do service-oriented architecture, so that should be the next, the next few slides. First of all, um, you should build your platform, right? And there are a bunch of steps how to, how to do it right, so how to build the right platform. First, you should really fuck the state. And when I say state, I don't uh, say a country, I don't, want to, I don't mean a country, it's, you know, it's your application state. Your application has to be stateless. There's no way around it. When you want to scale and when you want to do a good platform, your application has to be stateless. Um, in the old, I like to do another Jimdo example. So we had the, um, uh, a system which is delivering websites because you know a website builder, blah blah blah. And back in 2008, uh, there wasn't a time when I wasn't at this company. Um, our CTO was at a tech conference and he heard a talk about um, SQLite. And the day after, he came back into the office and said. You know, I was at the conference and I heard about SQLite and this would be so cool for Jimnu because, you know, we can every customer their own database. And unfortunately, I wasn't there, so I can't argue against it. So um, till that date, every Jimnu customer had their own database on the file system. <sighs> okay, um, this is not the only thing why we can scale and why we can split it up, but this was a thing uh, we... So it didn't take long till, till we realized that it, is a bad, that it is a bad thing, but at this point it was already implemented and used. So um, unimplementing a feature takes way more time than implementing it, right? <laughs> so um, there was a tough task and we had, you know, we had to do features. So that's why um, it took about five years to do it. And when I joined the company and I stumbled about the SQLite, I just grabbed the, the colleague who implemented it back in the days and said, you know, we're both going for an off-site sprint now and taking two months off to refactor the shit out. And yeah, this is what happened. So now we are rid of SQLite, which is really great. And now we can scale these systems. So every server now can deliver every website, which is really cool because there is no state at a single server. So being stateless is super important. And you should build up confidence. You know, when you're building a service-oriented architecture for your product, um, there's always the question, how, how we deal with authentication, right? Um, you might have calls um, which should not be accessible from the outside world, so your customers shouldn't do these calls directly. They should just an internal service. 
So I've seen, unfortunately, very, very much uh, companies, they're going with a VPN solution. So they say, okay, you know, I just have my web servers um, like shielding my internal VPN and all the servers I'm doing, I needing internally, they are resonating inside a VPN. But I, I don't feel very confident about it because again, it adds more complexity and as we hear, complexity is bad. So what I would suggest is to use HTTP. You know, we are all very familiar with it and at a very basic level, you get basic out. This is like not the very best when it comes to security uh, relations and <laughs> I know all the security people in here would kill me for that. But, you know, it's, it's, at least, it's at least better in nothing than nothing. And when you want to do more, um, there's also like OAuth, things like OAuth too, you can do. And to not implement all the OAuth handling over and over in every service, you can just like think of a little proxy, so like um, a little node proxy, which just like doing uh, the OAuth stuff. So your service, your PHP service does not listen to any um, public interface. It's just listening to a, to a local interface so your node service can like, terminate the OAuth and the indication and pass it through. <laughs> this would make it even easier in development because you don't have to care about indication when you don't have this proxy in front. And talking about confidence, um, use SSL wherever it makes sense because when you're doing basic out, do SSL, you know, you won't send your password plain. Um, you should also design for independence. So isolation is like of the, the best word for this. Um, and this relates to the Amazon quotes I just made. Um, as uh, Jeff Bezos said, you should be able to found a company out of your service. This is what I would like, it's, it's a good thing. It's like a good rule of thumb. Um, that also prevent you to make too many services because you, know, you can even overdo this SOA stuff. Um, imagine you're a company I don't know, 20 developers, and you have like 40, 50 services. Uh, nobody can ever maintain that. So really, be sure that it's not too small and um, that it is, there is enough of um, business logic inside a service. And you should create reliability. Um, I love this topic because, you know, the last year I worked on our infrastructure team, and this, this, this point is a lot about infrastructure. Um, and I'm a really, really big fan of infrastructure as a service because you don't have to care anything about your hardware, <laughs> even if it's, maybe it's just not, just not hardware, right? So you can really focus on your business stuff and there are no failing hard disks, there's no you know, failing network components, there's no, I don't know, rack which is overheated or whatever could happen to fucking hardware, you just don't have to care. So this is really um, what I could recommend. And when you're doing um, infrastructure as a service, another point which is really important is automation. So you should aim for ephemeral hosts. So a host could easily, easily be replaced um, with another one just by running Puppet or Chef or any configuration system you want. So you should, you should be um, confident about when you're doing a service for your, for your company and for other teams inside your company, that you're responsible for that one. So everyone in your company is relying on your service. So you should really care about reliability. And you might have heard of single responsibility principle. Mm, this is kind of the same but different. <laughs> so when you have um, PHP classes, right, um, there's a single responsibility and you know when you have a manager class, it's definitely code smell. So because it's not doing one thing because it's a manager, it does at least twice or even more things. Um, when it comes to service-oriented uh, oriented architecture, um, I think this manager stuff is a good one. So when you have like a user management class, make a service out of it. Right? Um, every every user-related stuff can go into the service. So when, whenever you have a management thing, um, it's a good indicator that you, have a, uh, that you can make a service out of that. And talking about platforms, circuit breaker is one pattern you should really know about. Um, have any of you heard about circuit breaker before? Oh, that's great, nobody? But okay, I can explain it in all detail. And I don't want to like, <laughs> annoy anyone. Okay, so circuit breaker means imagine you have um, a service or an architecture and there's one service failing. It has really trouble to, to fulfill the request, right? 
And imagine this one is very important, so there are more services relying on that one, and it's failing, and I'm sending a request to it, and it's just, you know, it can't complete what I've sent it, and it takes long, and, you know, it's kind of struggling, and I am sending more and more requests to it, and the other ones are also sending requests, sending requests, so they're hammering all their requests on an already broken service. So how should this service ever recover, right, when there are even more requests, like, hammering it? That's kind of impossible. So don't hammer requests on services which are already struggling. And to do that, you can have this circuit breaker pattern. There are cool implementations for it. There's um, Hysterix, which is from the folks from Netflix. It's a JVM implementation. And uh, Yammer just did a circuit breaker JS, which is a JavaScript implementation. And when I'm now sending a request to a service, there's a little, little network layer in between, which is the circuit breaker. And when the circuit breaker realizes that the service does not answer in a given amount of time, or the answer is like invalid, it's like an error code 500, for example, um, it would prevent all further coming requests and just send the last error one, because the other one has to deal with, it, with the error then. And this leads to my next point, which is back pressure, because when you have the circuit breaker in place, um, there's still error in your system, right? It's not, the circuit breaker doesn't resolve any error. Uh, so it's just preventing, you know, to do more damage. So when this circuit breaker is doing um, the, the, like, re-answering the, the request of, of failure, um, and there's a kind of a back pressure popping up, right? Because the failure is, like, now um, pumped up, uh, pumped back to the system which created it, which created the request. So you should like, be aware that f failures should stack up and you, when your service can't handle more requests anymore, don't accept more than you can handle. So you don't have to take care of, of the failure which is happening. So you should decouple, right? A good, a good hint uh, I can leave here is like use queues for that. So don't communicate directly, just put a message into a queue and let your workers, like let the other service read, uh, read that one. So it's about building resilient systems. And you should always remember your protocol. So I'm a big fan of HTTP, and I would assume you're also. And HTTP is the, really it's the only protocol which has proven to scale uh, worldwide. Um, there's one petabyte of information into that protocol called like information on the internet, thanks Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> and um, there's 571 billion users using that protocol. So this one has definitely proved to scale. And you should not be, but on the, uh, on the other hand, you should not be afraid of doing your own. There might be use cases, and I don't know your use case, where HTTP doesn't make sense because, I don't know, it's your use case. Um, but then it's totally fine to define your own, but make sure you have checked all options before. And my most important point on this building platform thing is Timeouts. I got another story for you. So a friend of mine, uh, Matthias Meyer, he's working at Travis CI, and he just he would just once told me told me the story when we had a beer. Um, I, I guess you know Travis CI, and so they are doing pull request testing on GitHub, right? And they have one little worker checking the merge status. So when I opening my pull request, um, Travis would be notified, and then a Travis worker would check if this one could be merged without a problem, because otherwise, it's just not necessary to start the test, right? So GitHub once um, changed their API just a little bit, um, and Travis just didn't realize that fast enough. So what happened, they removed the API field, and the worker was trying to check that one field, but it wasn't there anymore. So the worker was retrying, because there was a failure, and was retrying. And it took the worker 10 minutes to figure out that for that particular one pull request, that the field is not, not even there anymore. So what happened is uh, they have a queue, and it filled up within two hours to, to the very maximum. So they cannot accept even more. Uh, so they had a timeout, but it was set to 10 minutes, which is, was completely stupid in this case, because it doesn't make any sense to wait 10 minutes when the worker is broken, right? Or when the response is broken. So you should be really aware of timeouts. And don't try infinitely. Just try for a, um, for a amount of time which makes sense. And another thing you could get out of this story is like, don't have just one worker. When it's like an important thing for your infrastructure, I always have one, more than one. And, and the fun part, it took them like one day to get all the jobs done. It was like a bigger outage. 
So there is a saying that people remembering three parts out of a, out of a presentation, right? Um, I'm, I'm giving you lots of facts today. And when you would just remember three things, I want that timeouts would be the first. Remember, when you're doing like ZOA, use timeouts, value timeouts. It's super, super important. All right. So interface, right? Now we have our platform like build up, and it's when you follow all the advices in there, you would be, I would be your customer instantly. <laughs> um, it's really hard to do everything right. I just wanted to, you know, describe what it what it could be like. And now you have your platform done. Your app is running, but how should other people talk with your service, right? So you have to define an interface. Um, and there are several ways to do it. The first way is. You know, you can define a, a high-level protocol, or not defined, you can use um, one high-level protocol. So the first I'd like to mention is Rift, right? You can go for XML RPC, or you could go for SOAP. Um, but you, have, you, know, you, have, you should have in mind that uh, there are some requirements to a protocol, right? So the first is ease of use. So SOAP and XML RPC are kind of out. There's Rift. Um, I don't know, there might be good use cases for it. I'm just not a big fan of it, but I don't want to run it in, you know, in front of a public audience. Um, but what is really important that it should be developer and machine friendly. Um, and that's like the requirements you should have on a protocol. And you can even go for message queues. So um, RabbitMQ is a, a possible thing, SQS from Amazon or Zookeeper. And they offer you reliability. As you saw on the, on the slides before, reliability is a very important thing when you do service-oriented architecture. So it would guarantee you that you won't ever lose a message. Imagine you have a payment service for a company, right? I love the payment as an example because payment has lots of cool constraints. Um, when a customer is requesting, like a customer wants to buy your stuff, you should not lose his request. It don't matter what's up with the infrastructure, when he wants to give you money, <laughs> <laughs> you, you want to make sure that the request is not lost. So queues would offer that kind of reliability. Um, depending on the queue, they are fast or easy to manage. <laughs> you should know uh, what you want to use. And I even brought some <laughs> really shitty diagrams, like how it could work, right? So on the le left, right, left side, <laughs> um, you got your service, and it's publishing the job into the queue, and then there's the other service getting the job out of it. It's really basic. <laughs> You can go a, a way advanced to set up, but um, it would just not fit in this talk. Um, to make it more detail, um, you know, your service is, I would assume it's a web server. <laughs> and it would, again, publish into the queue, and the other service hopefully have more than one worker, as I mentioned, to get this job out of there. And what you also can do is, like, you can do a classic HTTP API, right? I'm a Big, big fan of HTTP. I just love that protocol, as you might have realized, uh, because there's so much stuff you would need. It's already built into it. Um, have you seen, and I know Symfony does it too, and lots of framework does it, and I don't get it at all. Imagine I have a REST-like API, and I want to have a JSON response. What, are, what does all people do? They append it .json. <laughs> this is really crap. You know, there, is, there are accept header. When you want to have JSON, just Tell the server you're only accepting JSON. <laughs> There's no need for this dot whatever format stuff. But for one, some reason, I don't know, they're all doing it. Um, there's also content type, right? Uh, so whenever you're sending out a response, tell what your response is. Tell that it's HT, uh, HTML, tell that it's JSON, tell that it's XML, whatever, right? So you make use of it. And when you, have, when you want to send media information which does not fit any header, um, you can go with the x dash something. Um, you can define any kind of metadata you want to. And when it comes to classic HTTP stuff, um, I'm a big fan of JSON, but don't make it that complex that you should better go for XML. Have you seen this kind of JSON APIs which should be better XML? It's, I feel it's so worse, right? But people still argue that, hey, wait, it's, it's way easier to read for humans. And I'm like, no, it's not. You have like three curly braces and, and even more in the colon and whatever, and I cannot even read it. So I can better read XML. So the point is not to keep your, um, to, to make JSON or to make XML. The point is you should make your API simple enough to make it readable in any format. That's the point. And 
be careful with the restful term. I would say like almost no API is restful because you know there's three levels of rest and I've just seen one API which follow it completely and the HTAR stuff. So just say you have a REST-like API and everyone, everybody would be fine with whatever you're doing, right? Because usually when people say it's RESTful, it means they're using HTTP verbs. Done. <laughs> which is, when we talk about REST levels, it's just the first level. There's even more complex stuff like hypermedia and uh, discovery and whatever. So um, again, to these two points. So the first one, you should really remember out of this talk, it's timeouts. The next one is HTTP. It's a great protocol, and especially as of here, as PHP developers, I would guess most of us, it's like the one we've learned first. It's like the first protocol we've, we've learned, we've, and, and it's surrounded us every day. So it's a really great protocol, so make sure you knew all the tiny bits of it. So, you know, now we have a platform and you have an interface. So I have the most reliable platform ever and it has the coolest REST-like API doing HTTP, of course. Um, so now, uh, imagine your company has this one platform and everyone chooses their API, but this doesn't make a product, right? This doesn't make, just, just make some services. So in the end, you want to deliver one result. And it's really like tricky somehow how to integrate all these different services into another. There are different ways how you can do it. Um, and the first one is you can do it in the back end. So every team or every service should provide a, a library in the main language of your company. I know most companies have that kind of. Um, if you don't have this, uh, think about Swift again because it can just compile into any language. Um, I don't want to say it's like a good one or, you know, it's possible. Uh, or you can use HTTP again, right? Because I haven't seen any language which have not an HTTP client. Um, especially PHP has like hundreds. <laughs> I feel like everyone has written their own already. Um, so when I say you want, should integrate in the back end, it's services should ask other services for their data um, before delivering the response to the client. Um, I have a good example for that one too. Um, on Jimdo, uh, when you build your website with us, um, we offer you to have a blog. Um, blogs are super fancy when it comes to SEO, at least regarding to our SEO specialist. I have no clue about it at all. Um, so we as a developer had the very fancy idea to just load the content afterwards. So you know we want to make a service out of it and then let the content load afterwards after the page is loaded. And then our uh, SEO specialist goes crazy and like, <laughs> <laughs> he runs through the company and was yelling at everybody of us because we had this idea. And he said, you know, Google won't, uh, won't execute JavaScript, so you should not do that. So we had the idea to do it in the back end then. It's way better. Um, another ex uh, example would be like when you're doing e-commerce and you have a suggestion service because suggestion is like a super complex topic and it's a really cool thing to make a service out of it. You can easily integrate it in the back end. And the next point where you can do integration um, is, again, the protocol. So again, it's HTTP because in HTTP you can, do, you can get a lot of stuff like for free because it's already inbuilt. You have proxying inbuilt, you have caching inbuilt, you have authentication inbuilt, so you don't have to care about that. You just have to know uh, enough about it and you have to know how to use it correctly. And Integrating on HTTP, there are two points how you can make it. The first one is edge side includes, called ESI. Um, Symfony has this one inbuilt. Most people just finally does not know that. Um, it's not a standard, unfortunately. Um, there was some some like um, people who, who wanted to make it a standard, but they, they didn't succeed. It. Um, there is Xlink, which is a similar uh, XML standard behind it, but uh, edge side includes are widespread enough and uh, it works pretty well. And to give you just, I, I want to show an example um, how edge side includes will look like. So first of all, you would need a header and then just check out my super awesome web page. <laughs> and now, uh, the interesting part is, beside my super HTML5 skills, is um, line 10. So as you see in line 10, um, we have this ESI tag. So we tell, um, the web server or, who, or the proxy or whoever is doing the, the integration, um, that my source of this tag is behind this domain and at this root. So this is what the other service would deliver. So the Varnish proxy, when he's reading through that um, response, 
he would just see that there's an edge site include tag, he would query the other URL and fetch the content and replace it in there before the client gets re actual response. So just imagine that this site by HTML is like into the site tag and then you have the complete response what the user would get. And you can also easily integrate in the front end. Uh, it's like you can just do it in JavaScript, as I mentioned before. Any one of you use Jammer? Uh, one, okay, you might know it. It's like horrible, right? You're loading the page and you see just scaffolds. You just see tables, really. It's, there's almost nothing right on, on load time, which is okay because they don't have the SAO because I don't want to have my company secrets on Google, um, but it can get annoying. So it's really important uh, to do it right. When you do it, you should do it right. And another part, you know, humans, humans are sometimes difficult, communication is hard, but you should be aware of when you want to do a uh, service-oriented architecture, um, splitting the team just, do, just does not mean that you would split the components, and it does also not mean that the teams are going to split the components. So be aware of that fact. And when you have a state that everyone can decide, what, what could happen is that everyone wants to decide, and then you again have uh, the situation that you have a, a big chunk of team wanted to make this uh, one decision. And when you have teams making decisions on their own um, and they have to solve the same problem, it can easily happen that you do the same work twice. Um, this is kind of hard and, and you should be aware of that. And again, communication is, is important um, between the teams. Think of uh, Conway's law. So remember that your software architecture could easily look like uh, what your communication is looking, looking like. So I told you a lot of cool stuff about service and architecture, but there are obviously also bad parts I want to cover. In a shelled world, logging and monitoring is worse. It's really hard. Imagine you have 20 services. Um, you don't want to uh, have 20 logging systems, right? You still want to have one log aggregating all the files, and then you still have the problem that everyone who, who is used to decide on their own, so you have to make a company decision. Um, this can be hard. And monitoring is the same, right? You don't want to have 20 different monitoring solutions. You just want to have the one, and everybody is relying on it. And this one should be super reliable. So logging and monitoring is really like a difficult thing where you have to spend a lot of thought on that. And the most important point, you know, even if you build super reliable systems, uh, it will fail, so the question is not, will it fail? The question is, when will it fail? And if you're in the SOA world, when the shit hits the fan, it's getting, really, it's getting so worse, you won't even imagine. Like, you can easily get cascading failures, right? Uh, so imagine your front service is failing or delivering um, bad requests to another service as this one is failing, and then other ones relying on that are also failing, and your whole system is broken up. Uh, this takes some time re to recover it. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, um, you should really, like, when you follow the back pressure pattern and um, the, all the decoupling and circuit breaker, at least I can promise you that it would take some time till it will fail. <laughs> oh, uh, actually, there's one thing I want to mention for this slide, too. Um, when, I, when I created that one, <laughs> ever, don't, don't Google ever for when the shit hits a fan. <laughs> I ended up with a little kid throwing sticker, Snickers into a fan. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, last bad part. Um, responsibility. It's really a thing, right? When you offer a service to your colleagues, to your customers, you are responsible. There's no way around it, right? There's no ops department. Oh, at least, at, I hope there is no ops department because, you know, we are all cross-functional and DevOps is a thing. Um, and you're responsible of, of whatever is happening there. So you should not just pass the responsibility to, you know, oh, my teammate, he's taking care of that, I don't mind. Um, this can happen pretty easily. And as I said, I've, I've worked in the infrastructure um, department before uh, the, the team I'm working in now. Um, so I learned on call the hard way. <laughs> so I just had our pager and then I went to bed and then I had no sleep at this night. So on call is really a thing and you should you know, you should at least talk about it, who's doing on-call, and, um, and so, well, it's got a bit more complicated because developers of other teams have no, no clue what's happening in your system, right? So, um, that's like the what and the why and the how. 
And now I promise to give some real life examples. So here's what I got. Um, I've been to JazzConf last year, and there was a cool talk from Yammer. And right inside their slides, uh, they came up with this one. That's what they call the Yammer architecture. Um, I won't make any statement on that. <laughs> um, I, would, I would say it's complex, and I don't want to be that engineer who's working on the work feed, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I especially don't want to do on-call for that. <laughs> um, so they have uh, 10 external services, whatever that means, eight internal, five parties, seven storage, and three cache. That is, in summary, 33 services. It's quite a bunch, but they still have a grown product. And this is, at least, I feel like it's really a cool thing um, to, to have. It's really cool architecture. So I, I'd be curious to hear more about that. And there's one thing I also realized. Do you see that one? Yeah. Vario? Yeah. I have no idea what it's doing. <laughs> it seems to be like it's just there. <laughs> I don't know. There's no communication at all. But so, so I would assume it's, it's, doing a, it's doing a good job, right? <laughs> OK, I've got another example. Uh, you might know this. This is Twitter. Um, Twitter had like a hard, a really tough scaling story. So this is what the application looked like when they are growing and growing really fast, so before they did really fancy stuff. So they have their one Rails application, and they have their storage. That's it. <laughs> That's, that, that, that was Twitter SOA architecture back in, I don't know. Um, when you want to see um, the, the real, a really good talk about that one, there's uh, Decomposing Twitter by Jeremy Cloud. Um, that's why I steal the slides. Um, it's a really great talk. And, you know, in, in his talk, he was talking on how this happens and how they wanted to split it. And the cool thing is, at the end, it looked like this. And frankly speaking, this is just the part Jeremy was working on. So Twitter in general, they're super, super big. Even this on, on this slide where he is working on, they have over 20 services. What is still interesting, they got this monorail <laughs> still. So as you see, it's really hard to get, to get you know, your old shit away. Um, but I don't want to talk about other companies because it's kind of mean, right? I can, I can just talk shit about them and they have no, they cannot respond. So I want to talk about Jimdo. This is our system. It's proudly growing since 2006. Um, but you know, we are aware of that fact, and um, we had released our very first service um, for our iPhone app, which is out now already, um, which was the API router, and. Now, I am part of this template service thing. And at the moment, you know, we are learning all this stuff. And that's mostly where all the slides and all the ideas uh, I talked before came from. So we are learning the hard way. And I want just you preventing to learn the hard way. So um, when you want to build services in PHP world, um, a few buzzwords you should note. Um, you hopefully have heard of HTTP kernel interface. Um, use it. This one is great. <laughs> Whatever you are doing, no matter if it's any pre-built framework, self-written framework, or I don't know, Silex, um, they all, it's like the bigger one uses it already, like Drupal, Symfony, Silex, um, there's stack PHP around, which is kind of kind of like Rack from, from WeWorld, which is really cool, so you can just compose little services um, along this um, interface to do various stuff on the HTTP layer, like authentication, caching, uh, and these kind of things. So HTTP kernel interface is really my one thing. <laughs> um, so just, you know, let me remember, um, service-oriented architecture, service -oriented architecture sorry. Um, it has, you know, a bunch of good things. You know, you can scale systems independently. You will have happier developers and you will have happier customers because you're more reliable, you're faster, and you can react more quickly. Uh, you can de deliver features faster and uh, you have way, you know, you just have an easier life. That's in general, easier developer life when you split up services. On the other hand, um, there are some bad, some bad parts. Um, don't Google for the when the shit hit the fan. <laughs> um, but when the shit hits the fan, you know, it's getting complicated kind of, and it will hurt, but you should take that as a good opportunity to learn. <laughs> um, and, you know, when the system is failing, um, be, you know, take it as an opportunity to learn again. Uh, it's, it's, it shouldn't be that hard, right? Um, nobody will die. <laughs> it's, uh, you, you'll came over it. 
that's it. And as another bad part, you might lose some scale effects. As I mentioned, so monitoring and logging, uh, it's really hard to agree on, on that one thing. Um, so if, if you are uh, awake to, through all this last 50 minutes, um, I told you about three things you really remember. The first? Great. Second? Great. So that one missing, right? <laughs> Last one, and I want you to remember this three, is obviously service-oriented architecture. That's important. Really remember that. Do it. Practice it. And share your story. Thank you. <laughs>so we will have 10-15 uh, minutes for questions yeah uh, roaming mic both in here and in the other room so show sure hands we start moving the mics around for any questions you might have please hi, uh, hi. thanks for a great talk Thank um, you. I'm just wondering what are the implications for testing if you're going to have uh, functional testing integration testing how does that work yeah, if you've got that, lots that's, of services? that's a good question um, what we are doing at Jimdo I can just like share the, the Jimdo story on that again um, we have service mocks um, so as again, I'm working on this template service stuff, and it's a Rails app. And what we did is just we had a s very simple Silex application, which just mocking the API routes, um, just you know uh, always responding with the same thing. Um, this is the thing you can do. Um, there are even more complex uh, system in a more you know generic way where you can just uh, define, um, especially in Ruby world, there's like um, HTTP call mocking library. It would catch all system calls to, to the network layer and just give any response. So I would say you should mock it. And when it comes to integration testing, you know, um, a, staging, a staging environment is also important. So when you want to test locally, like having the mocks, and when you test like more general, um, having a staging environment which should be like really a one-to-one -one mirror from a live application. Does that answer your question? Okay. Wait, wait for the mic, please. Uh, what is your opinion about uh, uh, building back-end front-end interaction as a service? So let's say you have a back-end API driven and front-end is completely nothing to do with the back-end. Um, that's, uh, that's funny. Uh, uh, that's what we did when, when we had this uh, mobile application I just mentioned before. Um, sometimes it's crap. So frankly speaking, it's, it's really hard. Um, you have to have really, really good specs, and you should have a really, really good leader who's taking care of all the communication, which is necessary. <laughs> um, but you can be faster, kind of, right? So I heard it's hard for the front-end people because they need some kind of a place where they can fetch the API. So what I've seen uh, often is that they just spin up a little Ruby script, um, mocking the, the calls, and uh, not Ruby, sorry, Node. So they, you know, they're front-end guys. So, and they have this little Node thing, um, just mocking the roots and giving any kind of response what they think my backend will respond to. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not what we are actually responding then. And it's hard. Um, it, I guess it's depending on your team scale and if you can do. You know, when you're a little small, uh, a little team, you can still uh, work very closely. But I don't know, when you have like 50 developers, um, I think there's no real way around it. Having good specs, I guess that's the, um, yeah. the answer to your question. Good specs and restfulness. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <the laughs> uh, how does it impact performance? So if you have a single process, that would it? Um, interact with multiple services over HTTP, do you find that slows you down rather than having... Like in, in the case of services down or...? Uh, does it slow down your, your performance if you've got multiple services over HTTP? So um, it can impact your service, but I'm a big f fan of, you know, you should solve the problem when it actually occurs. So don't fix a problem which does not exist. Um, often it's fast enough, especially when you're just going for one platform and it's all in the same data center. You know, when it's all Amazon and it's all in the same region, um, network calls, even network calls can be pretty fast. And when it's not fast enough, make sure you utilize caching. Um, with caching, you can solve most of the performance issues. And when caching doesn't do it, um, then it gets really hard. But mostly caching is, is a good answer. Uh, hello there. Uh, when you have uh, like multiple systems and two systems, how do you usually link them together? For example, I have an event system that's a, serv as a 
of software as a service. Mm -hmm. And then I have my main system that has user records. Mm -hmm. So for apparently for these events, they need to be linked to the users. Do you use UIDs or how do you usually communicate? Because um, you need to know which event belongs to which user. Um, usually so speaking of, of what we did uh, in my current company, yeah, we, any, don't, we don't have a relation there. So I can't give you any like, first-hand experience. Um, UUIDs is obviously a good thing to do. Uh, don't rely on one database providing uh, like a primary key auto increment stuff. No. <laughs> this phase <laughs> <laughs> obviously pretty fast. Uh, so UUIDs is a good thing to do. All right. And when it comes to like um, message passing, uh, I would go for a message queue or um, I don't know message bus systems. Message There's bus. A ton of this kind of software around. Brilliant. Thanks for that. More Yeah, just a quick question on how you manage versioning, because there's lots of different ways you can go about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so yeah, versioning is hard. Um, best way you can do is API versioning. Um, that's, that's kind of complex. When you own all the clients, um, you can try to go without versioning. Um, so, but then you have you know, dependencies on you have to first update this server and then the other one. Um, but I think API versions is like what, what I did. I, I have no other idea how I would, would solve the kind of issue when it comes to versioning. Hi. So in terms of you were talking about defining interfaces yeah. and that all the teams would communicate through those interfaces. Mm -hmm. So I assume that means that the, there has to be a very structured way of communicating these interfaces and when they change and... You know, mm -hmm. basically, the teams themselves have to be very good at communicating so that they can define them. So, yeah. what advice would you give for making that happen, and also some of the problems you've seen with that communication? Uh, so, sorry, I just don't get the question. Oh, um, <laughs> basically, when teams are communicating, trying yeah. to define interfaces for yeah. services. So, one service needs to communicate with another service. Yeah. Wh what do you do to improve that communication? All right. Um, I think what Amazon did is, is really good there. So just treat your service as an, um, as an open source library kind of thing. So it's like having a good readme, um, having a good client library. So when you don't do like HTTP stuff, or even when you do it, um, offer client libraries. Um, this, this can really help uh, if, if you can do it. Um, Swift would thought of that for you, because you can compile a client libraries out of that. Um, and then obviously there's a lot of um, organization work you can do, right? Uh, lots of, I don't know, uh, meetings you can do all together. You can just like, um, defining uh, several people in the teams uh, who are responsible for interfaces and let them meet and these kind of things. Does it answer your question? Yep. Okay. Awesome. Um, so just continuing from the question about ver how do you manage versioning. Yeah. So it, you can version APIs and that's awesome. Um, I'm a fan for that as my team can probably uh. um, <laughs> attest to. Um, in terms of the data stores, for instance, in the schemas, how do you manage versioning those and ensuring that if you're mutating your API that the schemas, for instance, doesn't end up becoming like multiple databases of different versions, for instance, and so on. Mm, I have never dealt with this kind of issue. So frankly speaking, I have no idea how I would solve it. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't want to tell bullshit. <laughs> so it's better to no, say don't know. No, that's all right. So, so far, that's been probably the biggest issue I've had with service or uh, yeah. But I, I, so have you experienced the problem? Um, we are in the process of designing some potential okay. system um, related to this kind of architecture. I, I, would, I would think it's so. a pretty um, a problem which will occur, but I would guess it occur pretty late in the process. It's probably going to happen in the first instance. Okay. <laughs> because, yeah, yeah, as you know, when again about the use case. external facing features, yeah. okay. once you start mutating yeah. the functions. Okay, yeah, external, yeah, when you have external facing stuff, it's yeah. way difficult. Yeah. Is, there, is there a question in the other room? Uh, so far, no. I'll check again. There was one over here. There isn't? No. Should I come over there? Make me some questions. <laughs> Hi there, yeah, you mentioned um, lo logging and monitoring. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what tools do you use? Um, so we have a Greylock um, in our company, and everybody is sending this stuff to Greylock. Uh, I think Logstash would, would be another cool tool to use. So what I would recommend is just agreeing on one like, pre-built, ready-built tool. Um, Syslog, for example, is also a good thing, because everyone can just send to Syslog, and then there's like Logstash or Greylock just getting messages out of it. So the handover point is really well-defined. And for monitoring, um, 
we are going with a mix of Pengnum and PagerDuty. Pengnum and PagerDuty? Pengnum and? PagerDuty. PagerDuty. PagerDuty, yes. So I think we have time for one more question, if we have one. Yeah. If not, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll be around for the next two days. Um, just, <laughs> yeah. just come along and, and find me, so I'm happy to, to answer and discuss all the stuff with you face to face. So I would, I would like to uh, take a moment to thank Ole for his presentation. That's wonderful. Thanks for your coming. Thank you very much. <laughs> we, will, we will remember our timeouts and our HTTP and our SOA. Thank you. <laughs>